2007, the mobile phone giant Nokia was in its prime, but just three years later it was in peril. What led to the fall of the biggest mobile phone company on earth in such a short time? Eve Doze, Emeritus Professor of Strategic Management at INSEAD, has written a book on the amazing success and fast decline of Nokia mobile phones. And he joins us now. Eve, thanks for being here. Thank you. Eve, your book Ringtone explores Nokia's long history and its rapid decline in mobile phones using your years of research and experience with the firm. What led to its fall? I think essentially you know, Nokia was an amazingly successful company, as you, as you said, making relatively simple, basic voice phones back in the 90s up to the early 2000s. And in some way, they led the development of the fastest growing industry or business or product in the world. And they were the fastest growing industrial company ever. So it was really, really an amazing success indeed. At the same time, they relied on that success. So in a sense, they kept doing the right thing, what had been the right thing in the 90s for too long. In other words, they kept thinking in terms of physical products, of hardware products. and making an increasingly complex product range, the wider and wider product range, in the hope of matching market segmentation based on lifestyles and based on different consumer preferences, that led to an enormous product proliferation, which became very inefficient. And that happened at a time when, in fact, they should have shifted. And they could have done it years before Apple because they had all the right capabilities and competencies. They should have shifted much more to a software platform way of thinking. So uh, one thing that that comes out in your book is the matrix structure that Nokia started to come up with in 2004. Why did that fail? One flaw in the design was probably that the matrix was too slanted in favor of product family and product managers. So in other words, you know, rather than be a balanced matrix uh, between resources and programs or products, uh, it became essentially a customer supplier relationship where the platforms, meaning software development, marketing, sales, manufacturing, and so on, essentially became suppliers to people who were driving the show. So there was a big jump. And people were not terribly well prepared to make that jump, uh, simply in terms of training, in terms of experience, in terms of maturity. Uh, so there was a vacuum at the top. There was no longer the ability to set strategic direction, to set priorities, to provide guidance. They were relying on a, an operating system called Symbian, which was originally done for a personal digital assistant in the 90s. And that system was very good. But for each new product type that Nokia developed, there had to be some redevelopment of the software of the whole system. So that became an extremely expensive proposition. So we spoke a little bit about matrix organizations, but is there a general thing about or matrix organizations? Do they generally fail or are they? It's important that matrix organizations require people to be collaborative uh, and therefore to have this integrative negotiating skills, this, cap this capability to have empathy for each other, this capability to engage in dialogue rather than debate, to take the time to do so. So running a matrix organization fast and effectively is time consuming and requires some patience and energy. And some people don't have it, some organizations don't really encourage it. Adopting a matrix is not abdicating strategy. And if you delegate too much responsibility too low down in the organization to negotiations between middle managers, you run the risk of having the same problem as Nokia, having a proliferation of products and uh, activities which run into all kinds of directions. In your book, you argue that Nokia actually saw the future correctly in terms of the importance of data and multimedia communications and even foresaw the Internet of Things and the monitoring, health monitoring applications that we see today. Mm -hmm. Why did it fail to capitalize on these things? There's a huge difference between knowing and doing. And in a way, Nokia was a knowing company. They, they could see back in the 90s, they could indeed see what was coming. The problem is by devolving a lot of the day-to-day -day responsibilities for product policy choices, for technology choices and the like, to negotiations within the matrix organization, which, as we said earlier, were or were not so successful, they basically gave up the ability to be strategic over the long run. So although they could see what would happen, and the top management could brightly assess what would be coming, 
It did, was not reflected in the organization. And the organization, on the contrary, became highly conflictual, highly divided, creating a kind of strategic stasis, if you wish, where people fight into a stalemate. Uh, uh, and at the end of the day, unfortunately, there was a complete divorce between the strategic vision that had existed in the 90s and the organizational reality of the 2000s. And that's the main reason, I think, why they failed to act upon some of these very early and very perceptive analysis that they had carried out around really looking at the future of the industry. Uh, beyond what they did in the late 90s or very early 2000s, which was camera phones, which was the early smartphones, uh, and that they did very successfully, but that capability somehow got diluted by this divorce between vision at the top and operations in the, in the organization proper. How should companies make that type of transition, the transition from hardware to mm -hmm. services? Once you are into software platforms, it's a complex ecosystem. You have to collaborate. You have to learn very complex alliance capabilities, which Nokia didn't have, and most successful companies at manufacturing don't have. They have kind of customer supplier relationships. You also need to be able to think about different revenue models. Google makes money essentially on advertising clicks and advertising sales, advertising revenues. And in a way, the fact that they are interested in mobile phone is just because it gives them one more platform for people like you and I to look at uh, advertising on, uh, on their search engines or on their connections. So you know, thinking about very different business models in a, in a more complex ecosystem kind of alliance is something that is easy to say practically for managers who come from simple manufacturing and simple product-oriented businesses is a really a big jump. And many people are uncomfortable. From a strategic management perspective, what can other organizations learn from Nokia's failure in mobile phones? Let me start with, with perhaps the number one learning that the current chairman of Nokia, Aristo Silasma, draws from having st studied that experience. He only, he only saw the back end of it, and he was the one who very expertly managed to disengage Nokia from mobile phones by selling it to Microsoft. And his key point is, again, the point of you know, good news probably lead you to be complacent, lead you to some form of self-satisfaction and hubris, uh, somehow dull your attention, you feel very comfortable. Um, so when managers, that's what he says, he says, when my manager tell me good news, I'm very suspicious. And I always want to hear the bad news, because the bad news are ways to put us into an action mode, whereas good news put us in, into a sleep mode. I think another key message would be keep asking yourself, what are the core assumptions of my business? And am I sure that these core assumptions are still valid or will still be valid three, four, five, ten years from now? So keep questioning. Uh, if you don't keep questioning success, then at the end of the day, well, like we see all the time, Schumpeter will be right. In other words, success will breed failure. Um, I think a third one is I, the key importance of people, and how often this can be neglected. Uh, if you think of Nokia, I mean, the Nokia success was built on essentially what they called the dream team. And it's only when they left, after they had left, that suddenly the strategic vacuum I was referring to earlier became visible. So sometimes, you know, it's only when people leave that you realize how important they had been. So one needs to be very sensitive to how important people are. And I think one of the things that needs to be done very, very carefully, and it's hellishly difficult to do, and, and certainly Nokia did not do well, is to manage executive succession or leadership succession. That's fundamental. Thank you very much for being here with us, Yves. Thank you.